Tone is in your fingers is a true statement that I would really love to see be retired. Hey everyone, I'm Jack Fawcett and welcome to Real Guitar Talk. This is a series I'm doing where I'm tackling some subjects in the guitar world that I think are worth talking about in a more open and nuanced way than maybe they have been before, or at least what I've seen before. So, tone is in your fingers. For those of you that don't know what that phrase means, maybe you haven't come across it, I can't honestly imagine that, but... It means that in order to get good sound out of your guitar, the most important thing is to be a good player. And that is a very true statement. So, why would I say to stop saying it? Shouldn't we be saying things that are true? We absolutely should be saying things that are true. There are several issues with this phrase that I want to tackle. Number one, I want to talk about the perspective on it and what it actually means. Number two, I want to talk about the communication and the context in which we use it. And then I want to wrap it up by discussing the actual problem with the phrase and kind of how it sometimes does more harm than good when it's used. So if you think about the phrase, tone is in your fingers or tone is in the fingers, it's pretty exclusive. And this is where it becomes a problem. It's often used at odds with people looking for certain types of gear on their gear quest, right? These two things should not be at odds. These two things should work together. Now, in my first two real Guitar Talk videos, the first one was about guitar demos in general. The second one was discussing whether or not lower-end guitars are actually as good or better as some people claim than higher-end guitars. And in both of those videos, this idea of tone being in your fingers came up. With the guitar demos, was talking about how two people could kind of be in the same room and make the same rig sound differently. With the lower end guitar versus the higher end guitar, the most common comment there was that people didn't care about the guitar as long as they were a good player, right? You'd like to hear Joe Schmo wailing on a $100 guitar rather than see some lawyer or doctor who has gobs of money who can barely play three chords on a $10,000 guitar, which I have seen happen in real life, right? I actually have seen people who can't afford good guitars just absolutely kill it on lower-end guitars, and I have seen people who have a lot of money who can barely play on higher-end guitars. It's not really an epidemic of that happening. I think as much as we like to put that imagery forward, but it does happen in real life. So the important thing to remember when you're talking about tone is in the fingers, being a good player to get a good sound, is that the gear that you're using is a part of that equation. It's still sort of the umbrella. It's sort of the superseding most important aspect of it. Where gear comes in, I think most importantly, is stylistically and inspirationally. Now, I can't put it any better than Mark Knopfler puts it. Mark Knopfler, in a number of interviews, has talked about how when he originally wrote Sultans of Swing, it was written on an acoustic guitar, and the tonality of a Fender Stratocaster made him actually change the music because it gave him this great new sound, which gave him a new take on the song. Can you imagine Mark Knopfler playing Sultans of Swing on a Les Paul? Could he make it work? Absolutely. He could probably make it great, again, because he's a good player, so that sort of supersedes everything else. But from an artistic, stylistic perspective, the Fender Stratocaster tone is a big part of that song and what that song became and how we all know it and love it. Another example that I love in this sort of context is Eric Clapton with Cream on the Glenn Campbell Show. Now, in that, first of all, it's really cool because it looks like they're playing in Darth Vader's chamber where he can, you know, take his helmet off and then he chokes the guy in the Zoom meeting. Anyway, he plays it clean. Now, this is conjecture on my part, but I think it's a pretty reasonable theory. He plays it clean and he sort of doubles up the walk down on the classic Sunshine of Your Love riff. Now, he's playing a Gibson Firebird into his Marshall stack of the era. And what I suspect was that in this studio, he couldn't crank it, which means he wasn't able to get the big, thick, sustaining woman tone like he usually did. You know, the Firebird is a little bit more of a slender, twangy guitar, and then if he has to have the volume turned down, he's just not going to be able to get that tone. It's not like they had Line 6 Helix back then. So, not only does he double up the walk down, he attacks the song a little bit differently, but when you listen to his lead, he's adding in these like Chuck Berry sort of double stops and things. And 
listening to that, you kind of realize, like, well, how do you attack that song if you don't have that big, thick sustain that you need to deliver that riff the way that it was written? I love artist metaphors when it comes to, to guitar, right? I don't really like the axe metaphor so much. That's never really worked for me. I was just, you know, oh, what kind of axe can you cleave a man with? I immediately apologize to all of my followers in Scotland. I actually have deep Scottish heritage and Irish. Either way, it means I've got to defeat the English. I have English blood, too. I'm getting really off topic right now. I like the artist metaphor. So, if you're talking about Vincent van Gogh, think about Starry Night. Now, the talent is in the brush stroke, but that's not the only place it is. The artistic mind needs to determine what colors you use, and that is as significant to the painting as the brush stroke. You think about Rembrandt and these sort of hauntingly warm, dark colors. That's a part of his artwork. It's not just the stroke, it's the colors that he uses. If you think about the brilliant colors of Monet, or artists from the Baroque period, if you don't know the Baroque period, it's when you're out of Monet. So I think of that like the tonality of a guitar. You ever notice that a lot of these famous guitar players, they're very, very particular about their gear. Another common phrase that people love to say is something to the degree of like, well, they could play a cardboard box and make it sound good. And then some people take it really, really far where they're like, you know, oh, you could play the dead carcass of an aardvark strung up with electrical wire and make it sound good. And you're like, I'll allow it. Now, I get this compliment on my videos a lot, which I'm very, very deeply appreciative of. People will say, you know, hey, I can make anything sound good. Well, first of all, I absolutely cannot make anything sound good. But the sort of meat and potatoes of that compliment is saying, hey, you're a good player. Now, in that realm, this is the other thing. The more you focus in on your tone, the tone that you want, the more that tone is in your fingers does become true and sort of superseding and overbearing on everything else, right? So like if I'm playing a Stratocaster into a Fender amp and now I'm picking between Stratocasters and between Fender amps, that's gonna be less of a dramatic difference in tone than a Stratocaster into a Fender amp versus a Les Paul into a Marshall, right? You know, kind of, where the more you laser in, the more it is kind of like, yeah, the tone really just is in your fingers. Like, you don't get too worked up the, the sort of closer you, you zoom in. And with my channel, one of the reasons I think people like to say that I can make anything sound good is because, you know, my channel is, it's still pretty modest, but it's well-established enough that I think the companies that I work with know what kind of gear I use and connect with people on, and so I pretty much do stuff within a certain spectrum of guitar tone. So in that realm, I know how to work with gear and kind of get a good tone out of it. But if I start stepping out of that, I might be a little bit more lost. All this being said, where does this become important? Why is this important? Why should we kind of start really putting these two perspectives together? This is where we're getting to context and communication. First, I wanna talk about context. A lot of it has to do with how we discuss gear and its significance with each other. And specifically, I wanna say pertaining to beginners. So here's where this sort of came from. How many of you have ever been looking for a certain rig that an artist used on whatever song, whether it was a studio recording or a live recording, but it was a tone that you heard and you just thought, oh, that's awesome. I wanna know what they use there. And the conversation is either bogged down by, or sometimes hits a screeching halt by somebody just saying, well, it's all in their fingers. The tone is in their fingers. You know, don't worry about the gear. You need to just learn how to play like them. And it's like, you know, the one classic for me is BB King Live at Zaire. One of the best BB King tones, one of the best BB King for performances I've ever heard but I haven't been able to figure out what gear he's using because conversations have been stopped by the whole, it's in his fingers, man. Well, look, I'm a big B.B. King fan. I've got all kinds of B.B. King records, uh, studio, live, some bootleg stuff. He sounds very different in a lot of things. You can tell it's him because of his playing. He's almost one of the quintessential tonus in your fingers. But by that rationale, shouldn't he sound exactly the same on everything? No, the tone is very, very different. So... That, again, kind of goes into the stylistic interpretation. Now, where this becomes important for beginners is, I saw this perfectly summed up once, this kind of perspective on it. There's like this old football coach, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. 
And this was how it was summed up. It was, hey, if you can't play a Stratocaster into a clean Fender basement and make it sound good, then you need to stop. You need to be able to do that before you need to worry about any sort of gear. Is there truth to that? Like, sure. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that statement. If you can make a clean Fender basement and a Fender Stratocaster sound good, then you're going to do pretty well. Because that's actually, as great a rig as that is, it's also kind of unforgiving. The problem with this attitude and this take on the conversation, especially regarding beginners, is that that is really an outdated attitude because it doesn't take into consideration two really important things. One is the accessibility of gear and good gear that's very performance and recording worthy. The second is distractions, right? So 30, 40 years ago, that would be more true than it is now when there were less options and it was you know, a little bit more expensive of an investment to get into good gear. Nowadays, I mean, I used to gig with the second generation Vox Valvatronics and it sounded awesome. You can get those for dirt cheap now. Those are considered like dinosaurs now compared to the other modeling stuff that's out there. Now the problem is the opposite. We live in this sea of accessible tone and sometimes that makes it harder because it's kind of like, what do I settle on, right? The second thing is the distractions, and I think this is actually a more important one, particularly when you're talking about young guitar players. You know, young men certainly affects young women as well, and also older folks as well. But between things like social media, video games, and pornography, there are so many easy ways for people to turn their attention away from something really positive, like playing the guitar, pursuit of a musical instrument, to something that can be very negative and have significant pitfalls in life. Social media just absolutely eats away at people, distracts them from their time, distracts them from their friends and their relationships. You know, video games are uh, an expensive road to nowhere for most people where they just kind of like get immersed. You know, I had an old roommate who left all of his friends and his family to go live with people that he met on World of Warcraft halfway across the country. And pornography destroys people's relationships. Now, I'm not actually intending on going on a moral soapbox here. Obviously, I've just kind of made a pretty bold statement that some of you will disagree with, so I don't really want to go down that road too much. But I would seriously challenge any of you to make a compelling argument that those three things are a better use of your time than the pursuit of a musical instrument. I just don't see it at all. And again, particularly with young kids, be a part of the reason that they turn to the guitar. And all it takes is giving them a little direction on gear, right? You can even add in something. Like, let's say somebody wants to sound like John Mayer. You know, well, tell them to get a Stratocaster-style guitar. Tell them to get a, a modeling that'll do, like, a Dumble sound or a Fender sound. You know, maybe a Tube Screamer or a Klon or a Blues Breaker, whatever. Then also add in, after the fact, but you really gotta listen to the way that he bends, his vibrato, that's as much of how that tone sounds so good. So use this sound, but really focus on that. That's a better way to communicate. Again, go into context and communication. Now I wanna be very clear. This is not one of those, some people would find this offensive. Instead of this, say this. No, 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 no. If someone is offended by the fact that it takes skill and practice and dedication to become a good guitar player, then not only do they deserve to be offended, but honestly, they're going to be in for a rude awakening when that hits them. But it is not going to hit them by you dismissing their pursuit of gear and just saying, well, it's in your fingers. Now, I want to come back to the phrase itself and why we need to stop saying that phrase. Because again, you know, I've just made these statements that it's, you know, it's, it is true, but we need to change the perspective on it and, you know, certain context. So, so why stop saying the actual phrase? Well, the actual phrase has basically become a platitude. Now, obviously, platitude generally applies more to a moral stance on something. This isn't really a morality thing. It's kind of a, you know, I don't know if we would call it a musical wisdom sort of thing. But platitudes really aren't a good form of communication. They essentially just kind of make us feel like we're smart and part of a club, right? It's more like a badge that we wear that says, you know, like, hey, look, like, look, I'm one of the smart old guitar players. You should listen to me. And that is not an effective form of communication because really all that's going to get is a groan. You know, if you just say like, well, the tone's in your fingers. Don't worry about your gear. Tone's in your fingers. Then people are just going to go, Ugh, whatever, man. Okay. And then go look someplace else. So if you can find a more effective way of communicating this to someone, then you're essentially going to get the message through to them 
by just not using a simple phrase that kind of makes you feel good and warm and fuzzy inside. Now, the last thing, and I mentioned this back towards the beginning, is the inspiration factor. And, and I think this is maybe the most important thing of all of it. And I know many of you will be able to relate to this. Having a good guitar plugged into a good amplifier, maybe some effects if you like effects, if it's something that inspires you, everything about playing guitar gets better. If you're playing a guitar and an amp and a whole rig that you're just loving the sound of and it plays well and it's just like right where you live, it makes you want to play more and you will play better. I struggle with bad tones. What is a bad tone? That's a whole different video. But tones that just are not agreeing with me and I feel like I'm always fighting it or it's not giving me what I want for the right context of the song, this, that, that, and this. If you have the right tone, you just so want to play. And that's really, really important. So be a part of the reason why people find their right tone and not turn away to something else. What do you all think on this matter? Do you think that this is completely ridiculous, that we're taking it too seriously? Do you think that this is a really important viewpoint on the subject? I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I'm Jack Fawcett. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.